When I was young, I loved nothing more than going to car dealerships, wherever they might be, local or if we were out and about seeing them. I was just that sort of child and it's always fun, particularly when you can't drive, just seeing, well, different cars poking around, pressing your nose up against the glass, smelling the leather. Well, we thought we'd do that sort of thing here by putting it on film. So we've come to North London with one, two, three, four, five, six, lots of 997s, but also some other very interesting cars that some of them aren't Porsches, to hexagon modern classics. Now, Paul Michaels has been running car dealership for many years, since the 60s really, and he's also been involved in race team and F5000 cars, Formula 5000 cars, and even F1. And he's waiting inside to show us around. Hello, Paul. Hello, Henry. How are you? I'm good, thank you very much. Good. So, plenty to, to talk about. Exactly, lots to talk about. Should we start here? In the ivory corner, we have a 365 GTC4, while in the light blue corner, we have a 365 GTB4, perhaps better known as a Daytona. These are twins, but not twins, um, both from the same period. This was the, I don't want to call it the cheaper version, but it is now. Um, it's a two plus two, got power steering. The mechanics, very similar. However, this was the purest car and this was more the people's car. So today, one is one third of the other, which makes, I think, this an amazing bargain. <laughs> it's all about originality. Original trim, very early car, plexiglass car. Um, with a, a wonderful history, ordered by a colonel, mm -hmm. and the colonel wasn't happy with one, he bought two. He bought a comp car and this, and he, he raced, obviously, the competition car, and this was his road car, but he had in his mind that he wanted to check the top speed. So he found a place where he could test it, and over the mile, it only did 171 miles an hour. And it was meant to do most of, supposed to do 173. <laughs> anyway, so he sent it back to Ferrari, having a long discussion with another the Colonel Ronnie Hoare, and they eventually agreed it would go back to the factory, be checked out, came back to the UK, and lo and behold, did 174 miles an hour, which has made a difference to him, but I'm not sure it would have made a difference to anybody else. But. Um, I just love the fact it is so original. It smells wonderful, doesn't yeah. it? Well, it's original leather, original dash. Because it's been garage most of its life, the problem with these dashes is they went off color and they faded literally almost into oblivion. And this, as you can see, is more or less like it was the day it left the factory. So a couple of 300 SLs, this we know about, but that, that's slightly that, different. That's another crazy story. We don't know completely the history. What we do know is it was made in Germany, it's made of teak, and it must have taken hundreds and hundreds of hours to complete as a piece of sculpture in, as in a talking environment. Point and, sort of and as a talking point, it's just wonderful. Mm. And right. it does steer, and the wheels do turn. Imagine steering's a bit wooden though. It's yes, a, a... <laughs> say the least. Um, and that's, well, that brings us on to, because this is sort of it's more than it's not like a normal car dealership atmosphere. this is a gallery type atmosphere added to by my wife's gallery here selling lots of ceramics and beautiful artworks and yeah. you know the whole thing rubs off each other where else can you see a fake mercedes with beautiful bits of ceramic and <laughs> ceramic art surrounded by car art as well so yes no it certainly it, it gives the whole place a very different feel, isn't it? That's the it's idea, a, yeah. A, she won past the, the blue Dino. Um, this was the beginning, dawning of an era. Absolutely. Um, all other mid-engine road car Ferraris. They from, grew up from here, the mid-engine range, all started with the Dino. Absolutely. Again, very unusual colour to see. A this Dino. was a UK right drive car, yeah. We're not sure how many blue cars there actually were, but it was a tiny number. Um, mm. And again, I used to have them when they were new. They're really a very usable Ferrari, whereas the Daytona 
was not something you'd run to the shops in. No. Okay, it was cheating, it was using a Fiat-based engine, but you literally got in, turned the key and drove off. Whereas with the Daytona, there was an element of cold start and cold synchros and all that kind of thing. So this was the beginning of a usable Ferrari. Yeah, we've wanted to pass the Super America, but they're fairly, fairly rare as well. They are, um, again, last of the generation of front-engine convertibles. I remember the roof system being slightly compromised and that you had to make sure you put it up before it started yes. raining, otherwise the thing was going to tip, tip water on yes. you. <laughs> Walking back past the entrance and more pieces of art, I'm still not quite sure about that wooden gullwing, by the way. We come to the other half of the dealership and some of Paul's own cars. It gets even more extraordinary down here, doesn't it? Well, in terms of the, um, the importance of the products, this car is the X Sterling Moss Equipe Endeavour DB4 GT Lightweight, which is part of history, part of Aston Martin's history. Um, Tommy Sopworth, a real Aston Martin man and unfortunately passed away relatively recently and I had a phone call from his secretary could he please drive the car one last time so we arranged for it to go to Snetterton he drove it very slowly thank God um, around Snetterton because it won a Snetterton um, didn't it so, or, I'm not sure if it's this car but I know DB4 GT definitely um, won I'm not sure whether it was there. this one or not um, but the most important thing with this car it's never had a major accident Apart from a couple of minor skirmishes, the reason I've retired it is it got so competitive um, that I just felt this is silly. <clears throat> Sooner or later, you're like a custodian. I don't want it broken in my time. No. So. See California up there, which is also again I've had that beautiful. since 2006. Mm. Well, there's a sort of link between that and that, to yeah, that same era, isn't it? Because same yeah. era and Moss left. But if you think if that was a Ferrari, it would be double the value of that. Mm. And especially if Moss had driven it, it would probably be three times the value of that. So there's no logic to some of the... This was, you know, basically trying to keep up with Ferraris. Mm. That's what they did. I'm just going to mention quickly as well, you, there was a very large spirit of ecstasy yes. over there. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, Slightly funny story. We were walking through in Italy, walking past a shop, and that was in the window. So we got dragged in, or I got dragged, dragged in, um, and we ended up buying that, the two chairs that are there, right. the Jaguar, <laughs> which is there, and um, it was like they were destined for, for here. <laughs> From one competition car to another, which I can see peeking out around the corner, it's not every car dealership that has a Le Mans <laughs> Porsche. Two Le Mans finished both which is unusual in its own right. This is a very early car. Mm -hmm. So this is literally a turnkey car. Whereas the later ones, you had to have technology to start them up. This is literally a 3.3 turbo put into this car and the aerodynamics and obviously tweaking the engine made the difference. This car probably should have won Le Mans, but there was a mess up on the last pit stop and it ended up fourth. It then came back a year later and was eighth. We used to have it in our BMW showroom and to say it upset BMW would probably be a slight understatement. All the kids used to love to come in, look at it, see it, touch it. Mm. Because for quite a lot of kids this is the first time they would have come face to face with a real mm. race car. We've got another pairing here. Very much so. Um, another thing I don't quite understand because normally the moment you put a Zagato badge on something it becomes double the value of a standard car. Absolutely, well, if, if the DB4 GT was, yeah. a, was a Zagato, it would be three <laughs> times as much. Yeah. And here we have a situation where the normal car is a third more than the Zagato. There we are. And as a driving car, of course, this actually drives better than that because it's lighter. Out the front. Right. I, I don't think I've seen that many 997s since, I, sort of, since there was a launch of 997s, <laughs> probably. I don't so. think, well, no <laughs> Porsche dealer would have that many 997s. This was a quirk when we packed up BMW in 2013. I decided that I wanted to go primarily Porsche because we were a Porsche dealer. As you can tell by his extensive stock, Paul strongly believes that the 997, second gen only mind, will be seen in a better and better light as the years go on. As he says, it's the last 911 before VW got involved. It's hard to disagree. 
And this was the ultimate 997 yep. GT2 RS. It's, uh, Again, being slightly facetious, quite why you need nearly 600 horsepower, I don't know. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's what this has. And um, to say it's fast is an understatement. Yes. Um, yep. You'd have to go to something like a McLaren or an F40 or something of that nature mm. to go materially faster. Mm. Yes, you would go materially faster, but you'd be uncomfortable. You couldn't get in and out of it. You can't enjoy it as an everyday mm. car. Just, that's a 3.6 turbo. I think they made something like 12 or 13 of them in that spec right drive. Wow. So, and it's done virtually no miles, a couple of thousand miles from you. So how much is that, something like That's that? That's around the half million mark. Wow. Arena Red, I know somebody that would like that. And it's, mm. yeah, but it's, again, it's like new. Yeah. Club Sport, yep. Carrera RS, again, that's not, that's a competition-based car. Right. So it's not quite like these that you could use it as an everyday, no. everyday car. This was Sport a classic, Porsche Classic. Yeah. Um, the last real 997 ever to come off the line. They are value-wise three times a normal one. Everybody said it's just phenomenally well, overpriced and sort of why would you do it? And now, look, anyone that's bought it is... But there is an element of illogicity to it. Mm. But again, it's a motion, it's a 997, and that will be the last ever great car. And the numbers were tiny Absolutely. and they're all numbered. And we've just sold this particular car. <laughs> and it's, you know, where am I going to find another one? They've just yeah. got so valuable, it is true. <laughs> this was, we just wanted to create an atmosphere. Absolutely. And you can see there's the D-type Jag, there's the Trojan that we raced before we went into Formula One. Um, I had JWK, the XK120 works car, so <laughs> I had a copy done of that. It's all just part of the silly history. And explain briefly the sort of the, you, know, you say before you went into Formula One, just for people that don't know. Yeah, well, we history. started with the D-Type, yeah. um, which we raced for a year. And we evolved from that to a birdcage Maserati. From the birdcage Maserati, we went to a list of Jag. The Trojan. Then the Trojan was a test day we did at Silverstone. In the morning practice, we got to be within one and a half seconds of the lap record. In the afternoon practice with John driving it, we were two seconds under that record. And one final question. If, heaven for Fen, should the place be burning down and oh, you, you, could, you could only <laughs> yeah. go and grab one set of keys and get one would thing out? Be that. I um, thought, thought you might say yeah. that. <laughs> without that. Paul, thank you very much indeed. It's thank been a pleasure. You. <laughs>so there we are that's our tour around hexagon classics as i'm sure you'd agree paul michaels is a fascinating man he didn't really talk about it but when they went into f1 he bought a brabham bt42 and he was effectively just a, a car dealer from london then he entered formula one he bought the car off bernie as he said it's just bizarre it's a fascinating story i'm poking around the showroom there are obviously wonderful things like the daytona and the db4 gt but even out here it's just i mean there must be half a dozen 997 GTSs, which I, I don't know, I, I get excited when I just see one of those on the road. BMW over there, 635. This, I just like walking around car dealerships because I like cars. And of course, this has got the art aspect to it as well. And as you walk out, you can't help but notice this, which he found in an art dealership in Kensington, apparently. It's a horse that was, well, the tail was pointing the other way when he bought it, but he's made it into a prancing horse and it's made entirely out of car parts. You just never know what you're going to find on a road in East Finchley, do you?